It's October 15th, 1988. The Oakland A's are one out away from winning game one of the World Series. The Dodgers are hoping Kurt Gibson won't let that happen. And you probably know what he's going to do next. There's a good chance you also know that Gibson wasn't even supposed to be here. But as it turns out, neither were a bunch of other key players that got us to this moment. Let's rewind. We'll start with someone who's definitely supposed to be here. Closer Dennis Eckersley. The major league leader in saves, Eckersley only blew eight opportunities all season. He was dominant in the ALCS, picking up four saves and only putting three men on base in six scoreless innings of work as the A's swept the Red Sox. He's in position to make that five straight saves here with two outs and an extremely unlikely base runner on second. That's Mike Davis, who spent the first eight years of his major league career with Oakland before signing with the Dodgers after the 87 season. At the time, LA thought they were getting a solid offensive contributor, but then Davis slumped badly, finishing the season with only 15 extra base hits and a batting average below the Mendoza line. Mathematically, Davis shouldn't be on base. Davis had a very, very difficult time adjusting over in the National League. He's had the worst season of his career, yet called in as a pinch hitter to face one of baseball's all-time dominant closers. Eckersley had only walked 13 batters all season, and he'd only done it with two outs and the bases empty twice. Davis swung at the first pitch and fouled it back. The bat didn't leave his shoulder for the next four pitches, all of which were outside. And that's how Kirk Gibson has a chance to flip this one-run deficit with one swing. And look who's coming up. Let's talk about that deficit, though. Given that it's game one, you'd expect both teams to have sent out their best starting pitchers, and you'd be half right. Oakland's starter was Dave Stewart, who won 21 games for the A's. But it was actually the Dodgers who put Stewart on the path to this World Series appearance. When they drafted him in 1975, Stewart was a catcher, and the Dodgers converted him to pitcher because they liked his arm strength. Things never fully clicked for Stewart in LA, and after a couple of trades and a failed tryout with Baltimore, he was on the verge of being out of baseball until his hometown A's signed him to a minor league contract in 1986. Not long after, they called him up to the majors, and he blossomed from there, winning 20 games in each of his two full seasons as an Oakland starter. And he was solid against the Red Sox in the championship series. Two starts, two wins, and just two total earned runs. Stewart was solid in this game also. He gave the A's eight innings, seven of which were awesome. The other one was, well, it's the bottom of the first. With his first pitch of the World Series, Dave Stewart hit Steve Sachs. And immediately a hit batter. With his 10th pitch, he gave up a two-run homer to Mickey Hatcher. Way back, and it's gone. Mickey also wasn't supposed to be here, at least not playing left field and batting third, both of which were spots for Kirk Gibson. And he definitely wasn't supposed to hit a home run, a thing he did once in 191 at-bats during the season. But there he was, tearing ass around the bases all the same. This was most of the damage the Dodgers did against Stewart, though, only manufacturing one other run while he was on the mound. What about the starting pitcher for LA? Theoretically, it should have been Oral Hershiser, the National League wins leader who set a new Major League record with 59 consecutive scoreless innings this season. But he was coming off of three starts and a relief appearance against the Mets, throwing as many innings as the rest of LA starters combined. The last of those starts, a complete game shutout in Game 7, even though the Dodgers took a six-run lead in the second inning. So, Tim Belcher got the start instead. Like Dave Stewart, his career began with the opposing team. About a year before this game, Belcher was sent to the Dodgers as the player named later in the trade that put Rick Honeycutt in Oakland. And while Belcher was a good part of the rotation in his first full year in the majors, he was not, regrettably, Oral Hershiser. After escaping a bases-loaded situation in the first, Belcher loaded them again in the second. With two outs, up came the man who hit more homers than anyone in baseball in 1988. Jose Canseco. At this point in his career, Canseco was a phenomenon. He won AL Rookie of the Year in 1986, and before the 88 season, he said he believed he could be the first player to hit 40 homers and steal 40 bases. And then he did it. Even though he'd collected 114 home runs in his career so far, Canseco had yet to hit a grand slam. In fact, with the bases loaded, he was only 7 for 30 at this point. Surely he wasn't about to become the 15th person in baseball history to hit a grand slam in the world's... Well, 
Yeah, yeah, he was. There's no park in America that could hold that one. That meant Belcher was done. For what it's worth, Hershiser only got pulled before the sixth inning in three of his 34 starts this season. It's 4-2 after two innings, and most people watching probably thought we were in for an offensive slugfest. But going back to the bottom of the ninth, it's 4-3. LA's bullpen did their job, keeping the Dodgers in the game long enough for us to get to Kurt Gibson in this moment. And like I said earlier, Kurt Gibson also shouldn't be here, for a couple of reasons. Let's go back to the offseason before the 1986 season. Gibson was a free agent coming off a season with the Tigers where he hit 29 homers, stole 30 bases, and drove in 97 runs. He got a contract offer from Detroit and nobody else. Gibson wasn't the only free agent getting ignored, though he did get a Sports Illustrated cover for his troubles. And the Players Association decided something was up, so they filed a grievance. Jump forward all the way to January 18, 1988. Arbitrator Thomas Roberts, having already ruled that the owners colluded against free agents in 1985, awarded Gibson and six other players new look free agency, which allowed them to sign with another team without having to void their existing contracts. Gibson wanted to stay in Detroit. He was a Michigan native, went to Michigan State, and has played for the Tigers his whole career. But the Tigers only offered him one extra year and that made LA's offer of three years, four and a half million dollars, impossible to turn down. In return, Gibson rewarded the Dodgers by leading the team in home runs, doubles, on-base percentage, and slugging percentage. The Dodgers improved by 21 wins, and Gibson already had one moment of postseason heroism. This solo home run with two outs in the top of the 12th inning that won game four against the Mets. But two Gibson injuries in the NLCS, one to his left hamstring in game five, and one to his right knee in Game 7, kept him from starting this game. In fact, according to Vince Scully, he wasn't even in the dugout. And there is no Gibson, the man who was the spearhead of the Dodger offense throughout the year. Supposedly, Gibson heard that comment while watching the game from the clubhouse, and that's when he decided to get up and get dressed. He watched Davis get on base, strode to the plate as the pinch hitter, and listened to the crowd erupt. So, here we are. The A's have gotten a great performance from the starter who was turned into a pitcher by the Dodgers, the first grand slam from one of their young sluggers, and two outs from one of baseball's greatest closers. LA's last chance rides on a base runner who worked a miracle walk and a leader with two bad legs who is at the plate for the first time tonight. Welcome to a moment in history. High fly ball! The Dodgers went on to win the World Series 4-1, and then the following year in 1989, the Athletics swept the Giants in the World Series to win the Battle of the Bay. Then in 1990, Major League Baseball folded. Like and subscribe. <laughs>